everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Tanya Haas and I am the in-house health and wellness writer here at MedCan. So thank you for joining us on your lunchtime. Uh, now, before I introduce our presenter today, I wanted to share a few things. So this presentation is being recorded and will be sent to you in the follow-up emails. And you can also go to our website, medcan.com under MedCan Insights, if you'd like to see any of our previous webinars. Due to the number of participants we have with us today, we have muted all incoming audio. And if during the presentation you have questions related to brain function or brain health, you can submit them during the presentation. Uh, right here in the top corner of your screen, you'll see an orange button. Go down there, you'll see the question row. Click on there and then you can type your question in that box. And um, we will be able to see those questions. They will remain anonymous. And if Dr. Owen has the chance to um, review them uh, and he will he will be able to answer a few questions. Unfortunately, we won't be able to answer all of the questions today. Okay, so um, my next thing that I'd like to tell you is that we will also be mentioning some services at MedCan that support some of the strategies that Dr. Owen will be mentioning today. And we do have a special offer for all the webinar attendees, so thank you for joining us. And finally, just a reminder that the inv information in this webinar is for educational and information purposes only and is neither intended to be relied upon nor to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Now, with all that being said, I'd like to, I'm honored to share the microphone with our presenter today. Dr. Adrian Owen has spent the last 20 years pioneering breakthroughs in cognitive neuroscience. His work has been published in prestigious journals such as The Lancet, Nature, Science, and the New England Journal of Medicine. The fourth assuming is Canada Excellence Chair at the University of Western Ontario, Dr. Owen was a senior scientist and assistant director of the Medical Research Council's Cognition and Brain Sciences Unit in Cambridge in the UK. He's, he works there and at the Wolfson Brain Imaging Center at the University of Cambridge, he used functional neuroimaging to explore attention, memory, and control in brain injured and healthy volunteers. He revolutionized the assessment of brain function by harnessing the power of computerized cognitive testing, and he is now the chief scientific officer at Cambridge Brain Sciences, a platform for tracking and optimizing cognitive performance. His recent book, Into the Gray Zone, documents Owen's ongoing quest to understand the relationship between brain, mind, and consciousness. Adrian, over to you. Thanks very much, uh, and thanks uh, for listening. Um, uh, what I'm going to do is to tell you a little bit about um, how our understanding of the brain function, and, uh, uh, in particular uh, brain cognition, has evolved over the last 50 or so years, beginning with a little bit of history and then uh, coming right up to date with some of the uh, latest research that's coming out this year. So um, in, 19, in 1960, um, a rather ingenious experiment was carried out on Mount Everest. Uh, and this is actually part of one of uh, Sir Edmund Hillary's uh, uh, famous um, expeditions up, up Everest. It was the so-called Silver Hut expedition. And the, the plan that they wanted to uh, look into was to, to, to see how um, altitude uh, or fatigue could affect uh, cognitive performance. And what they did is they got a whole bunch of climbers at about 6,000 meters to sort cards uh, into the uh, appropriate decks, while of course they were very, very fatigued and uh, under the influence uh, of altitude sickness. Uh, and the results of that experiment were uh, that in fact you, you can sort cards uh, at high altitude, um, but you are just slower to do it. Now, the reason I started my presentation with this example is that uh, almost all cognitive testing that includes things like IQ testing and, and other types of uh, brain assessments um, derive from this sort of idea, and that is that what we're trying to do is measure performance. And if you uh, look at some of the pictures below, these come from the Applied Psychology Unit, where I, I worked for 16 years. Uh, there are things, uh, other types of uh, processes like divided attention and vigilance were, were looked into. And uh, the way these ideas were dreamt up at the time were people would say, well, we need people to, uh, we need to be people to be able to monitor, uh, say, four clocks at the same time. Let's see how well people can do that under various sorts of stressors. 
The problem with all of this is that uh, we're 60 years on now uh, from then, and there's been 60 years of uh, neuroscientific advancement. And uh, many of our ideas and ways of, of testing cognitive performance have really failed to take that, that those 60 years of neuroscientific um, advancement in, into consideration. And the reason that's very important is because if you just measure performance, if you just say measure divided attention, it doesn't tell you very much about how we might perform on other tasks. If you imp manage to improve your attention, does that make you any better at sorting? Whereas if we can say understand the brain processes that, that drive these abilities that allow us to do things like sort cards or divide our attention or maintain our vigilance, then we can make predictions about how improving those brain processes may, for example, improve our performance on lots of different things. And here's a, another historical example that I think illustrates this rather well. So I'm sure many of you are will have heard of the case of Phineas Gage. He was a, a, rail, a railroad worker in the early 1800s who uh, was tamping dynamite uh, and there was an explosion and the tamping rod uh, shot straight through his brain, through his brain and, and out the other side. It went up under his chin, as you can see from this reconstructed uh, MRI scan uh, and left uh, the top of his head. Now, surprisingly, Phineas Gage survived uh, and actually he survived for quite a number of years after that, but his life changed quite dramatically. Um, basically, he lost his ability to make any sensible decisions. So he started gambling, his marriage fell apart. He, uh, basically, his whole life fell to pieces, but not in any way that could be assessed by a single test. It was actually very difficult uh, for the people looking at him to put their finger on what had happened to Phineas Gage. And the reason is because he'd had a, a large piece of his brain removed, and that part of the brain is involved in all sorts of different cognitive and, uh, and, uh, and social uh, processes, all of which were sort of disrupted in small ways, leading to uh, his life basically falling apart. But this was not something that you could test well, with a simple test. But it, now, um, 150 years on, we know a lot more about the, why the damage to Phineas Gage's brain caused the problems that it did. Uh, that to me, uh, 30 years ago, uh, in 1988, uh, I was in Cambridge in the UK. Uh, and what we did is we, uh, as part of my PhD, uh, set out to design tests not to measure aspects of performance, the sorts of things I've just been describing, but to measure specific aspects of brain function. Uh, and uh, the idea here was to try and develop tests that could uh, not only uh, assess different areas of the brain and what they did, but also work out um, uh, what makes performance bad on these tasks, what types of brain uh, impairment might make performance bad, and perhaps how we could even enhance performance. Now, all of these tests were based on the neuroscience of the time. So they weren't, in, they weren't based on 50-year-old cognitive tests that have been conducted up Mount Everest. They were conducted on uh, neuroscience. So here's one example. This is what we call the token test uh, today. It's based on what's known as the radial arm maze, which is probably the most widely used animal testing apparatus in um, in, in neurophysiology. Typically, uh, rats or mice are put into a radial arm maze and they have to uh, visit each of these arms looking for bits of food or pellets, food pellets, and try and avoid uh, visiting the same arm twice. It's a, it's a complex memory task. It's been used for many, many thousands of neuroscientific studies. And our version, uh, at the top left there, you can see the, the version from 1988. The bottom left is the version that we uh, use today. Uh, it's presented on a touch sensitive screen, but the idea is basically the same. Uh, obviously, we don't test rats with this. Uh, we test humans, and the idea is that you visit those boxes on the screen uh, and try and look for the green tokens, avoiding boxes where you've been before. Other tests were developed based not on animal studies, but on human studies, on studies of patients. Uh, this is the test of uh, block tapping. Again, it's a simple memory test. Uh, the on the top right, you can see the original form, and on the bottom right, you can see a patient performing the test. This was developed by uh, a guy called Phil Corsi at the Montreal Neurological Institute in 1971. Uh, we took the task in the late 80s and turned it into what you see in the top left there, uh, and then uh, there it is as it, as it exists today in, in the bottom left. And essentially, the idea is that you just have to remember uh, a sequence of color changing boxes uh, and the boxes, uh, the, the length of the sequence gradually increases. And what we're looking at there is your spatial memory ability, your short term spatial memory. Now, through the 1980s and 1990s, um, I was involved in many 
uh, studies in uh, both neuropsychological studies and brain imaging studies that I'll, I'll show you in a moment to try and understand exactly how these tests tap different types of brain processes. Uh, here's an example of one of those studies. The MRI scan you're looking at there uh, is a view from above. That's a, a patient who's, uh, who has, uh, has a, a, a brain lesion in uh, their right hemisphere. Uh, and, and looking at patients like this, patients who'd had surgery, for, for example, to remove tumors, um, I was able to show that um, this part of the brain is involved in performance on the, the spatial search task. And that's because, as you can see from the graph, patients with frontal lobe damage uh, had higher strategy scores. And in this instance, a, strat a high strategy score is a, is a bad thing. So this was a test that appeared to be specifically sensitive uh, to damage to the frontal lobe. So um, we were beginning to focus in on conclusions like, well, if you're bad at this task, then you might have a problem with the frontal part of your brain. Other studies that we conducted at the time were uh, on patients with neurodegenerative conditions like Parkinson's disease uh, and Alzheimer's disease. This was, uh, again, from an early study that I conducted as part of my PhD, where I compared patients at different stages of Parkinson's disease with healthy participants of a, a similar age uh, on that simple block tapping task, or at least on the, the computerized version of the block tapping task. And it turned out that this is pretty good at detecting early Parkinson's disease, an inability to remember uh, an ascending or an increasing sequence of color changing boxes is one indicator um, uh, that, that, uh, that you may be in the early stages of Parkinson's disease because uh, patients, even, even uh, before they showed clinical uh, symptoms, were showing impairments on this task. Uh, through the mid and late 1990s, I spent uh, a period at the Montreal Neurological Institute in Canada where we used positron emission tomography or PET uh, and functional magnetic, magnetic resonance imaging or fMRI to try and understand again a little bit more about which bits of the brain are involved uh, with these tasks. And basically we would put healthy participants or patients, people with Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease into the scanner and we would have them play these games, do the tests and we would look at which parts of the brain changed activity while somebody was doing the test. And uh, on that basis, through a whole series of studies, we were able to map out which brain regions contribute uh, to performance uh, on each uh, of these tests. And that really brings us uh, up to date. Um, just um, prior to my uh, arrival in, uh, in Canada uh, seven years ago, we um, decided to take these tests that at this point had had more than 20 years of, of research uh, using them uh, into an, an online format so that uh, members of the public or anybody who's interested in testing their brain function could actually take the tests uh, and uh, monitor their performance over time or see how certain interventions, for example, lack of sleep or um, physical exercise um, or even brain training could affect performance uh, on some of these tasks. Uh, so this became the Cambridge Brain Sciences platform. This is the very early, this is how it looked in the early days. Uh, it looks a, a lot a lot better. It's a lot easier to use um, these days. But essentially, the tests are the same. We've, uh, through now uh, more than 25 years uh, and over 600 academic publications, we've maintained as closely as possible the core uh, scientific um, uh, 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 the, the scientific nature of the tests themselves to make sure that we can extrapolate from uh, uh, one study to another and make sure that we, we know exactly what we're measuring, that we're measuring the same thing consistently. Uh, we look at things like uh, memory, uh, as you can see here, reasoning, concentration and planning. And uh, by putting this um, online, it meant that we were able to start conducting really big studies instead of the sorts of things I've told you so far involve perhaps 20 or 30 patients. Uh, uh, by uh, putting Cambridge Brain Sciences online, it meant that we could um, access thousands, uh, tens of thousands, and sometimes even hundreds of thousands of participants to ask some really big questions. So these are two papers um, that came out. The one on the left uh, came out in the journal Nature in 2010. And what we did there is we recruited 11,000 people. We got them to brain train using a commercial brain training uh, or commercial brain training systems for six weeks. Everybody was encouraged to uh, train for a, um, 
few, uh, at least a few minutes every day for six weeks. Uh, and we showed uh, absolutely no improvement on these cognitive tests. No gen of course, everybody got much better at the things they were practicing at. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the critical message here is that people didn't get any better um, at other in, in other cognitive domains and other things that uh, our, uh, the, the brain training community would have us believe should have improved uh, with that amount of practice. On the right hand side, the date at the bottom there is wrong. That's a paper that came out in 2012 uh, in Neuron. And there, what we did is we took our test to tackle the issue uh, of IQ. Can somebody's cognitive or mental performance really be reduced to a single number? Uh, as a neuroscientist, this has always seemed to be a, a rather um, odd uh, notion to me, in the same way as none of us would believe that somebody's physical fitness can be reduced to a single number uh, so it always seemed a little odd that we believe that our, 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 our mental fitness if you like could be reduced to a single number and what we did there is we recruited 44,000 people online uh, to perform the Cambridge Brain Sciences tests uh, we took a subset of those participants and put them into an fMRI scanner uh, looked at the parts of the brain that were involved in the tests and what we were able to show uh, is in fact you cannot reduce a person's cognitive performance to a single number. At best, you need three components or three factors to fully describe uh, the population, fully describe uh, somebody's um, uh, cognitive performance. And that was, the, uh, that was our uh, fractionating human intelligence that came out in Neuron in 2012. So let me tell you about some key insights that um, I've learned over the last uh, 30 years uh, doing this type of um, neuroscience-based uh, cognitive uh, assessment. And I'll begin um, with actually the most recent one. And this is that sleep is really important. And this actually um, comes from a study that uh, we're actually submitting for publication today. So it couldn't be more, um, more relevant. This was a, a study we've conducted over the last six months where we recruited again almost 40,000 people uh, to what we... Um, well, for, fortunately, when we chose the world's largest sleep study, uh, we didn't know it would be, and fortunately, it turned out to be that, so um, we didn't end up with egg on our face. But uh, the world's largest sleep study has about 40,000 people who all tracked their sleep. They told us how much they were sleeping, how much they generally slept over the previous month, uh, and then uh, they uh, monitored their sleep over several nights uh, and then did our tests. And because we have so many people, we were able to look at how much sleep is enough and how having too little or too much sleep can affect cognitive performance. And I'll just give you uh, a few highlights here. The first one is probably not very surprising to most of you, and that is the absolutely, um, the optimal amount of sleep is between seven and eight hours. So in fact, it's 7.6 hours uh, is the, uh, on average, is how much sleep you should get to maintain uh, your best possible cognitive performance. What may be more surprising to some of you is that both too little or too much sleep can affect that. So it's not only, and I think we would probably all, all know already that too little sleep uh, is, is not good for your cognition, but also too much sleep uh, actually also reduces your ability, your ability to do things like uh, reason uh, and perform complex problem solving the next day. Um, we looked at people, for example, who reported uh, surviving on average uh, on about four hours sleep. And it turns out that those people were worse, significantly worse on every single measure uh, than the participants who reported getting between seven and eight hours. And because we had so many people, we could actually turn this into uh, you know, a, a real life measure. What does this mean in real terms? And in real terms, it adds about 10 years to your cognitive performance. So if you're 50 years old and you are getting by on four hours sleep, then your cognitive performance is much more like a 60 year old than a 50 year old. So that's a sort of a, a real world translation uh, of, of what this data can actually mean. Uh, we also looked at the effects of aging. Uh, most of us already know that uh, we tend to sleep uh, uh, sleep less as, as we get older, and, and we were able to show that in, in our data too. The older participants reported sleeping less. But importantly, the, op the, the optimal amount of sleep didn't change. So even though the, uh, the older participants slept less, those older participants who were still getting between seven and eight hours were achieving the best possible cognition. And one interpretation of that is that 
although there is a tendency to sleep less as, as you get older, you would probably benefit cognitively by continuing to sleep uh, for between uh, seven and eight hours. We also looked at how changing your sleeping patterns can affect performance. And I think this is important for people on a day-to-day -day basis. Many people think, well, I could get away with not very much sleep tonight. Uh, in fact, you can't. Uh, a single night uh, of changing your sleep habits is actually much worse than uh, having less sleep uh, over a long period of time. Uh, we found that people even, you know, people, for example, who uh, generally get between seven and eight hours, if they change that in either direction for one night, they get they, they have more sleep or they have less sleep for a single night, we could detect changes uh, in their cognitive performance. Fortunately, for those of you who are only sleeping four hours every night, uh, there's also a little bit of good news, uh, and that is you can improve your cognition. If you're a regular uh, uh, short sleeper, uh, even a single night's sleep can uh, improve your, your, your cognitive performance. So, um, yeah, the message there is try and sleep between seven and eight hours if you can, uh, and especially if you're somebody that claims to be able to get by on four hours sleep. I'm telling you, you can't. Um, right, let's move on. So, uh, um, I think I've actually covered, uh, well, let's, let's leave that, sorry. So, I, 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 a good sleep hygiene, I would say, is, is important. And, and just remember the last thing I've said about being consistent. So being consistent is as important as having a lot of sleep. So uh, if you can't do anything else, try and keep a routine. Try and go to bed at about the same time and get up at the, at the same time. Avoid departing too much from your regular sleeping habit. And of course, most of you, I'm sure, already know that you should avoid eating, drinking, or any cognitive, cognitively stimulating activities immediately uh, before you go to bed, because that uh, all of those things will delay the onset of sleep. Um, the second uh, take home message here is that exercise really matters. Um, this is something that comes up in the popular uh, media reasonably frequently, but there's a very solid scientific literature now that's been built up uh, over about 40 years on the relationship between exercise uh, and cognition. It is absolutely not um, a fad. It is not, um, it, it is a, a real effect. It's been replicated both in non-human studies, in, in rats that get exercised in the lab, uh, as well as humans. And there's really um, two factors here. Um, one is a long-term factor, that uh, long-term exercise uh, is beneficial for cognition. So maintaining a, a regular exercise over a long period of time will keep you uh, cognitively in better shape uh, than if you don't do that. There's also good evidence for a short-term effect of exercise. It's simply uh, taking part in some aerobic exercise for 20 minutes can um, produce a short-term, and by that I mean about another 20 minutes, boost uh, to cognition. So if you really have to make some complex decisions or solve a very difficult problem, uh, then get on the treadmill for about 20 minutes beforehand. Um, now, the mechanisms for this are not well understood, and that may not be surprising. Uh, we don't understand exactly uh, why it is that exercise uh, improves cognition. It does appear to increase neurogenesis, that's the growth of new neurons in parts of the brain, like the hippocampus, which is an area that's known to be involved, uh, very important for memory. It also seems to stave off cell death as well. But again, as I say, the, the molecular and the cellular mechanisms for exactly how that works uh, are not particularly well understood. Um, uh, there's also a, obviously a, a, va a vascular um, component here that uh, simply exercising will improve the vascular to your, uh, vasculature to your brain. It will improve the flow of blood and therefore the deli delivery of oxygen to the brain. And it's, it's pretty clear why that would obviously be a good thing and it's likely to have uh, beneficial effects. Um, <clears throat> not all exercises, and, and the, uh, the literature is a little bit um, uh, um, so varied here, but mm -hmm. not, not all exercise has exactly the same effects. Um, there, there is evidence that all, all types of exercise can be beneficial. Um, in general, if you had to choose something, then uh, I would say the literature on aerobic exercise is consistently stronger uh, than, uh, than than other types of exercise. So uh, uh, short bursts of aerobic exercise are certainly beneficial. Um, 
So, um, <clears throat> as I've said, about 20 minutes uh, is all that's needed for a quick boost. Uh, if you really want longer terms of uh, longer term cognitive benefits uh, of exercise, uh, then you need to maintain a longer term program uh, and exercise regularly three or four times a week uh, for many weeks. But as I say, there have been several studies that have shown that that sort of, uh, of exercise over weeks or months. Um, can systematically improve cognitive performance on tests like the, the Cambridge Brain Sciences Battery. And that just leads me to make another comment, which is that one of the really important things to do here is to make sure that you are measuring your cognitive performance effectively. And, you know, there are there are some good tools out there and there are some uh, things that you know, claim to measure your cognition and, and, and uh, you know, and may not have the same uh, 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 scientific basis. And I think the really important thing is if you're going to take on something like this and and measure your cognitive activities, uh, your cognitive performance over time is that you do it uh, using a valid scientific tool. Um, the third uh, one, there's really, there are four take home messages here. The, the, the third one, I think, again, won't be um, a surprise to a huge number of people, but that is that diet uh, and nutrition matter. Um, this is something that you can't do um, with a quick fix. You can't really get a really um, an instant boost in your cognitive function just by eating the right food. Um, I remember when I was a graduate student back in um, the late 80s, uh, tryptophan uh, suddenly came on the radar as being, tryptophan is something that occurs, it's, uh, it's a lot of it in bananas and in turkey and in uh, nuts, uh, and it suddenly looked like tryptophan was going to be a so-called cognitive enhancer. Everybody around me in the lab started eating a lot of bananas, um, uh, thinking that this would improve their brain function, and it did, but it turned out um, that it only made them good at a very specific type of test. Um, the, the effects of tryptophan really are quite specific to a type of uh, memory task. And in fact, um, many years later, looking back, we now know that, um, and this is the case for many uh, single effects like this, uh, tri tryptophan can actually make you poorer at some other tasks. And that sort of underscores the importance of really understanding the underlying neuroscience. And now we know a lot about how tryptophan works in the brain. We know how tryptophan works in different parts uh, or it affects performance of, uh, of tasks that depend on different parts of the brain. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, just eating a lot of bananas isn't going to make you really smart. Um, it, there's also a, a sort of, a, as well as, um, so, well, so the, the take home message there is that um, there isn't really any one thing that you can do to improve your cognitive performance, but uh, a good balanced diet um, is uh, always a good thing. And of course, it's it's good for your physical health. Uh, it's also good um, for your uh, uh, for your mental health. Um, there is another uh, there is a, another literature that's actually uh, sort of related to this, but is addressing a quite different issue, and that is. Um, about about weight in general, about being overweight, underweight, uh, particularly about being obese. Um, there is a growing literature showing um, that uh, weight or being overweight uh, can significantly increase the risk of developing dementia. Again, the, the, the mechanisms of exactly how that works um, are not clearly understood, um, but uh, it, it is certainly an effect that is worth uh, bearing in mind. Obviously, those two things are related. One can change change one's weight uh, by maintaining a healthy diet. And as you can see from the second point there, there's also good evidence that intentional weight loss can actually lead uh, to memory attention, uh, improvements in memory attention and executive functions. But obviously, all of these things um, should be done uh, in, in moderation. Um, the final point here is, is about stress. I think many people think that stress uh, is a bad thing. Um, stress is another area um, that has been very well uh, investigated in the neuroscientific literature. And this is both there's a, a, a rich uh, literature in, in humans uh, under stress, typically uh, in, in naturalistic situations, but also there's a literature in, uh, in, in animal models uh, um, uh, where animals are, are, are put under stress and, and, and the effects of their uh, on their cognitive performance um, is uh, is monitored, and, and overall, it, you know, it, it's not true that stress is a bad thing. Um, for many types of tasks, a small amount of stress is actually a good thing. 
Um, and as you can see there from the graph on the right hand side, we often, the details are unimportant, but we often see a pattern like this in data that uh, is what we call the inverted U-shaped curve, which means that there's a, a midpoint that's good for you. And either too little, in this case, stress, or too much stress can be bad for you. Now, obviously, in extremely stressful situations, uh, performance is going to be impaired across the board uh, in almost all aspects of cognition for, for, for a variety of different reasons. But uh, a small amount of stress uh, has been shown to uh, improve uh, task, particularly uh, tasks that require uh, intuition or emotional decisions to be made. Um, it seems as it's almost as though having no stress, being completely uh, relaxed and unstressed in those situations um, is not helpful. You actually need a little bit of drive, a little bit of motivational stress to be able to make those sorts of decisions. However, uh, tests that require a lot of calculation, a lot of thought, and what we call working memory, that's a type of uh, short-term memory where you only hold something um, in memory for as long as you need it. Uh, things like this uh, that we know are very dependent on the frontal lobes of the brain uh, seem to benefit from actually having uh, not much stress. Um, so it's better to be completely de-stressed in, in those situations. So um, when you're uh, when you're looking at reducing your stress, obviously if, if stress is a big factor in your life, then you should try to reduce it. Uh, try and find uh, a level that you're comfortable with and that um, fully uh, optimizes your uh, uh, your um, cognitive performance. And obviously these things are related. Uh, there's a very strong relationship between uh, sleep and stress. Uh, people that generally don't get much sleep tend to be uh, more stressed, similarly with exercise. Um, uh, a moderate amount of exercise can certainly uh, de-stress you. And this is one of the reasons why um, we use tools like Cambridge Brain Sciences to do to do these massive studies with hundreds of thousands of people. Because one of the things that I've learned over uh, the last 25 or 30 years is that you, you could do a lot of really cool studies in the laboratory involving functional neuroimaging or you know sophisticated um, tools, but a lot of effects are so subtle or are so or so complex um, in, in their the way that they involve the interaction of many factors, that you can't really detect them uh, by simply putting 30 people into a brain scanner in a lab. And I think uh, the effects of, or the relationship between sleep, exercise, and stress is, is a really good example of that, where we have these three factors that are all known to affect cognitive performance. If you can optimize all three, uh, then you will undoubtedly uh, benefit cognitively. Uh, but we're only now, through these massive studies of large numbers of people, starting to understand exactly how those three things interact together and how actually uh, you, you, you've got to keep them all working together um, uh, in order to maximally uh, optimize uh, cognitive performance. And I think that's something that's still very much uh, a subject of intense science, uh, neuroscientific uh, scrutiny. I'll, I'll end by just telling you um, what doesn't matter. Um, in, in a way, um, one of the things I really enjoy about doing science is uh, debunking things um, because once, in many ways, it's much easier to show that something isn't true uh, than to keep trying to show uh, that something uh, is, and there's a scientific principle behind that. Um, the take-home message here is really to avoid quick fixes, and this is how I've gone about my uh, scientific uh, life really for most of my career, which is to, if somebody asks me a question like, does brain training work? Uh, what I do is, the first thing I do is I look at the world around me and I say, well, if brain training works, then all my friends who are using the so-and-so brain training device should be smarter than the rest of us. And, you know, I think you'll all agree that usually that isn't the case. Uh, and, you know, that guy that you know that spends six hours a day using his handheld brain training device, is he actually smarter? Uh, is he doing better in his career? Is he, you know, is he, uh, is he earning more money? Typically, the answer is no. And that was the basis upon which I set about doing uh, this study that I mentioned earlier that came out in the journal Nature, where we took 11,000 people. And my reasoning was, you know, if brain training works, and again, this was using a, a commercial brain trainer, uh, if brain training does work in the way that the, uh, the commercial companies were, were, were trying to have us believe at the time, then if we put people uh, through their paces 
on the brain trainers for six weeks, uh, they should come out a whole lot smarter. Uh, and that isn't what happened, as I, I've said earlier. As, as I said earlier, in fact, um, uh, we saw no generalised improvements at all in any tests. So here, yeah, if something comes onto the market and somebody says, "This is the miracle. Take this pill." Uh, log into this website, you're going to be smarter in a week and a half, uh, then they are usually uh, or they almost certainly don't have the scientific um, data to uh, to support that. And the first thing I would say is uh, ask for the peer reviewed literature, ask for the papers, ask for the data uh, and make sure that something has been thoroughly scientifically investigated and proven to be effective before you invest any time or energy in it. So here's your uh, key takeaways. I hope this has been useful to people. Um, uh, the advanced in cognitive testing, and this is an ongoing quest, but they have allowed neuroscientists like myself to learn about how to maintain and optimize brain health. As I say, this is a work in progress. Uh, the more data we can collect uh, from tens, hundreds of thousands of people, the more we will understand the relationship between uh, a brain, uh, the, the brain and all the cognitive processes uh, that we are able to do in everyday life. Uh, like everything else, quick fixes don't generally work. Uh, smart lifestyle choices do. Uh, and this is a long term thing, although something I should have said earlier that I haven't. Uh, there's a lot of data showing that it's never too late to start. So this is not something if you haven't been exercising your entire life and you're now 52 like me, it's not too late to, uh, to get going. Um, but generally maintaining uh, healthy sleep habits, exercising regularly and uh, eating healthily uh, can certainly produce detectable changes uh, in cognition. And as I say, we have papers, uh, we have scientific papers in submission right now uh, uh, looking at the relationship between things like sleep and exercise uh, and cognition. I think I'll leave it there. Yeah, thank yeah. you very much, Dr. Owen. And there is no doubt that today was a um, a helpful experience for everybody uh, who tuned in. So thank you so much. We heard incredible strides about research, how lucky we are that you're here in Canada leading this field. Uh, we heard about the importance of sleep, exercise, stress, and congratulations on your world's largest sleep study. So I'm just going to move, if I could just get this screen for a moment. Uh, we're gonna move, I'm, while um, Dr. Owen um, and his team are reviewing the questions, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about mental health um, well-being at MedCan. Uh, and MedCan is, if you're new to us, we are a global health inspiration company and we offer services in a variety of fields, especially the ones that Dr. Owen mentioned today. So our mental well-being team is actually partnered with Cambridge Brain Sciences in many aspects. And um, in addition, we have psychologists with a variety of backgrounds and specialties who work with you in person or virtually. So regarding sleep, which was a big topic today, our psychologists can create a personalized strategy to address your needs, which could include cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. And if sleep apnea is suspected, we also have a medically led sleep team who can help investigate that aspect. And as we also heard today, our mental well-being is critical component of our overall wellness. So the psychologists at MedCan can help you manage both short-term, recurrent, or long-term sim symptoms. And they are well-versed in stress management, depression, as, as well as relationship counseling and related challenges. Now, um, Dr. Owen briefly spoke about uh, nutrition. Yes, so uh, as we heard, we, we, we want to be careful about eating too many bananas and turkey, uh, <laughs> tryptophan. However, um, he did mention that the Mediterranean diet is important and, you know, plant-based uh, diet and a lot of, you know, common sense that we hear in the popular media. But if you're having trouble making that actually happen in your life, perhaps you need some assistance with behavior change. We have an incredible team here at MedCan in nutrition, and we have a variety of programs depending on what you're looking for. So if this interests you, we do have an exclusive offer for webinar participants today, 15% uh, off uh, your preferred program. And as you can see on the screen, there are several different programs, including for performance, if you're an athlete or for children. And then we also, um, the pricing does start at 395, no HST, and the number of appointments and durations vary. The offer expires February 21, 2018, not 2017. We're not going back in time. Okay, so we are going to move now to questions. I have a few, some people emailed us ahead of time, um, Dr. Owen. So uh, this is a very big question. So how will our brain evolve in the future? What concrete parts will evolve and what parts will degrade? 
that's an interesting question. Um, I, I don't think we can possibly know, to be honest. I mean, they, uh, one of the things that's certainly changing uh, very rapidly at the moment is the, uh, the extent to, to which people depend upon external devices for things that we used to depend upon our brains for. Uh, everybody, or at least most people, carry uh, some kind of mobile device now. Um, most people, uh, I think, would say they're finding it more difficult to remember people's telephone numbers in large part because they never had to. Uh, and it's really unclear, I think, and it's an interesting scientific question, but we'll, we'll probably not only know the answer um, you know, in 25 years uh, about how that actually affects brain function, because there's certainly a, an awful lot of uh, work on, on uh, brain plasticity. We know yes. about, you know, use it or lose it uh, is often used as an expression. Uh, and, uh, you know, in a, in a changing world where people are using some parts of their brain much less than they used to for certain tasks, uh, you know, it wouldn't be at all surprising if, if we saw changes in, in brain function. Uh, okay, so time. yeah, two follow-up questions to that. So when cell phones first came out, a lot of people said, oh, am I going to be losing that part of my brain? And there was in the popular media discussion that, oh, no, you're freeing it up for other parts of your brain to use. Is there any data to support that? You know, I, so I tend to think of it as, as in the, the other way around. Um, you know, whenever something new comes along, and in my life it was television in the 1970s, people immediately panic about it and they say, well, what effect is this having on people? And I think the really important thing is to look at the big picture. And yeah, sure, um, you know, perhaps the part of my brain that uh, used to be stuffed full of people's addresses and telephone numbers uh, is now not being used for that because my phone does that. But, but think at the same time about all the amazing things that I can do now that I wasn't able to do because I have that phone. Uh, and that stretches my brain, if you like, it, you know, in other ways. Mm -hmm. So, and I think this historically has always been the way that people tend to focus on one specific aspect of a new technology and say, well, that doesn't seem good. But actually in the, the broader picture, you have to say, well, you know, are we better off for this? And are we able to achieve things that we were never able to achieve before with our brains? And the answer is yes. Okay. All right. And TBD also, I guess, to be determined. And it, uh, what is our current understanding of neurogenesis? And I think you spoke about that with neuroplasticity and the growth of new nerve cells. Uh, again, this is something that uh, will will change over the, uh, there will be huge advances, I'm sure, over the next uh, five to 10 years. At the, at the moment, most of this work um, has involved um, populations uh, uh, of patients who have a, a brain disorder of some kind, for example, okay. patients with, with Parkinson's disease. Mm. There's a lot of uh, animal models being developed looking at trying to regrow uh, neurons in uh, animal models and even uh, for example, the, in Parkinson's disease, yes. in, in patients uh, with the disease to try and, and improve the symptoms. And there's certainly been some huge strides and some big successes in that area. Uh, it's interesting to me that for some disorders, uh, it seems to work quite well, uh, Parkinson's disease, mm -hmm. for example, whereas in others, uh, we're, we're making uh, much slower progress, for example, in, Al in Alzheimer's disease. And the, uh, the reasons for that um, you know, are pretty complicated and, uh, you know, and, and, and uh, mostly uh, you know, not entirely clear, I would say. Um, there's some work on, uh, some really interesting work on plasticity in general. Um, with some of the new neuroimaging techniques we have available to us, we can actually look at how the brain changes, for example, when people practice certain tasks. And that's something that I'm interested in looking at in, in my own lab. We currently have um, a group of participants uh, taking part or, or do, doing the brain, uh, the Cambridge Brain Sciences tests every day, uh, and we're looking at how their brain maybe changes over time, how the physical structure of their brain changes over time, uh, and that's brain plasticity in action. It's fascinating. Now, the tools you have at Cambridge Brain Sciences are incredible. There's a reason why we have you here, and we're so happy, and there's so many great opportunities out there. We only have time for one more question. So if your question was not addressed today, we will uh, we will see if it's appropriate. We'll see if we can answer it, and we will reach out to you following this webinar. And I don't know if you're going to have the chance, but I'd love to hear more about your work with uh, with people who are in a comatose state or the there's a term the vegetative minimally state. vegetative min or minimally conscious thank you state. minimally conscious well, state you should read my book then. I would oh <laughs> tell me more tell me more what it's called again it's called uh, into, into the, the gray, gray zone, zone. yes, yes. Uh, it's not a, it's not a science book it's a book about uh, the process of, of doing science I like to think of it as being an, a, an adventure in science 
Uh, it's about a discovery that we made in 2006 that some patients who are presumed to be vegetative are actually completely aware, completely conscious of everything going on around them. And it's about how we made that discovery and the repercussions and, and all the other things that are uh, to do with that. So, it's fascinating. I watched a movie, which I'm sure you've seen, the French film um, that was based on a similar work. The Diving Bell and the Butterfly. Yes. yes. Excellent Incredible. Movie. Fantastic book as well. Okay. Here, folks, here's our last question. Um, right. So uh, I, let's read it. Yeah. The question is, would Dr. Owen's data suggest that commercial platforms like, and I'm not going to name the platforms, I think everybody is aware, uh, commercial brain training platforms, are they improving our cognitive function, i.e., are they not evidence-based? Um, well, there's a huge literature on this now, and uh, there I could most easily say there was a, a large meta-analysis this year of the data, and um, several hundred uh, neuroscientists put their names to a, a document two years ago uh, saying that the claims that are being made about brain training are hugely overblown. In fact, that document suggests that there is no evidence that any commercial brain training program can improve your general cognitive function. Now, that's not to say that practice doesn't improve performance. Uh, anybody that's ever played a musical instrument or learned a new language knows that that's not true. But the, the point is, if you uh, if you if you take part in these activities, if you play these games, you will get better at those games, but you won't get better at anything else. And I think the evidence is absolutely clear on that now. All right. Well, thank you very, very much for your time. We want to thank everyone who joined us. And please do not forget to fill in the survey so we can understand how uh, we can better meet your needs and your interests in the future. So we wish you well today and hope to see you soon. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.